Um, great. Uh, yeah, so the last talk in our session is also, uh, you know, ACT for scientific modeling. Uh, this time, John Baez will be presenting compositional modeling with stock flow diagrams. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm really sorry I couldn't be at the conference physically. A lot of great stuff is going on. So this is work uh, with a number of co-authors. It's also part of this algebraic Julia Gang. Uh, so Sophie Lipkin and Evan Patterson are at the Topos Institute. And um, Nathaniel Osgood and Jaoyan Li are up at the University of Saskatchewan. And I mentioned at the beginning, this is like a continuation of my talk on Monday, which was the theoretical end of decorated and structured coast bands. This is one of the various applications of them. I mentioned at the beginning of my talk on Monday, the importance of climate change and how we should all be working on that. I was trying to work on that and I wasn't making enough progress. Uh, and then this collection of people sort of spontaneously organized who are working on epidemiology. And I'm very aware now that having the right uh, collaborative team is crucial for making progress. And so I, I think of this uh, work as like a, maybe a, uh, in the, along the same lines as climate change uh, studies because these models that we're talking about can actually be used for a wide variety of purposes, but epidemiology is, is what we're uh, working on in specific. So there's a community of epidemiologists already existing who use a kind of diagram called a stock flow diagram to model the spread of disease. And Nate Osgood and Zhao Yan Li are members of that community and they actually are leaders of COVID modeling for the Canadian government. So they have a lot of practical experience with it and they teach courses on this technique and so on. Um, so here's an example stock flow diagram. Um, so you see that there are these boxes called stocks and there are three in this rather simple model, susceptible people, infected people and recovered people. So we have a disease going around and people can be in these three different states. And we have these double arrows called flows which describe people transitioning from one state to another state. Also people recovered can lose their immunity and go back to being susceptible. Uh, so that's the black stuff, but then there's this blue stuff and the blue stuff is, um, is not material flows. It's not flows of people. It's, it's, you could think of it as flows of information. So for example, uh, when susceptible people are turning to infected people, at what rate are they doing so? Well, they're, they're doing so at some rate that would be, for example, equal to the number of susceptible people times some number called the force of infection. What is that number? Well, that number might depend on various things. For example, it might depend on what fraction of the population uh, have the disease. What is that? Well, that depends, of course, on the number of infected people. So there's a blue arrow going from there but also on the total population, right? It would, be the, it would be the number of infected divided by the total population. Uh, and the total population in turn depends on, on all three of these stocks. So the, the blue arrows would represent uh, things that you'd be doing computationally in the model, whereas the black double arrows uh, represent actual flows of people or other types of entities. Um, this double nature of the diagrams was very mysterious to me at first, but I've gotten to actually like it very much. You could think of it as the division of our world into material and information to some extent. Um, so there's a systematic way to turn stock flow diagrams into dynamical systems by which I just, which is just a slick way to say systems of differential equations, ordinary differential equations in this case. And that's how people normally use stock flow diagrams modeling, although you can consider other choices of semantics for stock flow diagrams. Now, if you build a big stock flow diagram by putting together lots of smaller stock flow diagrams, there's a way in which its, system, its dynamical system can be uh, obtained by composing open dynamical systems for these smaller open diagrams. So this idea 
is what I call compositional modeling, or it's an example of what I would call compositional modeling. And it's very useful be, uh, for, for reasons that you folks are, I'm sure, aware of. Um, one, one reason though that you might not be so aware of is that very often in practice, different teams of people create the smaller models and then they wanna put together those smaller models into a larger model. Uh, but unfortunately, the current modeling environment for stock flow diagrams is done using software that does not really support compositional modeling. Most commonly, a piece of software called AnyLogic, which is a great setup for one person to draw a stock flow diagram and then have it automatically converted into a differential system of differential equations and then solve. It's great. But unfortunately, if I create a model on AnyLogic and then you create a model on AnyLogic, there is no way to combine our models short of one of us looking at the other guy's model and then typing it into to, to, to my model. And this is a serious problem. It's a serious problem because the models are huge. So here is Nate Osgood and Jayan Lee's COVID model, which is actually used currently by the government of Canada in any logic. So this is like a page in any logic. It's way too big and complicated to conveniently show in one slide. And that's not because I'm bad at making slides, it's because I'm trying to illustrate this point, which is that it becomes unwieldy at this size. And if I, and if this was created by several different teams of people, and then one of the teams said, oh, whoops, I wanted to change something, then they'd have to go into this enormous uh, web of, of stocks and flows and, and tweak one of them. Whereas what we'd like is of course, to have this built up out of smaller pieces in a, in, a, in a clear way so that if you can change one of the pieces, then the whole big composite gets changed. Um, so, so people who live in Canada, your, your health to some extent lies, relies on, on this uh, diagram here. I should say that the point of these models is not to predict the future and then sit back and know what's going to happen. It's, it's, uh, it's all of course very rough and, and ready, and it would be for great if you can use one of these models to approximately predict what will happen for say a few weeks, and then you don't wanna just sit back and watch it happen, of course. What you do is various analyses on the model where you figure out uh, how various interventions would affect the course of the disease. For example, if we increase some variable, will it decrease the number of infected people? So one, one applies various techniques such as uh, uh, what's called loop gain analysis uh, to, to investigate what would happen if we did various things to these models. And that, that's how these are actually used. So this lack of compositionality is of course exactly what applied category theory is, is supposed to be good for. So applied category theory should come to the rescue now. And indeed, uh, together with Evan Patterson, Sophie Lipkind, that's supposed to be a D in there, sorry, Sophie, and myself, uh, Nate and Xiaoyan have now created some software called Stockflow, which is a software that supports compositional modeling with Stockflow diagrams. And it's used, and it uses algebraic Julia, which you've heard about repeatedly in this conference, a framework for high performance scientific computing that lets you program using explicit uh, categorical concepts and which try, aims to clearly separate the syntax, that is the diagrams or whatever method you're using to model systems from the semantics, namely how the, how the uh, model is actually implemented. And as you've heard, this is being developed by a team of people, including James, Evan, Sophie, and, and many others, including Tim, who you just heard, and I can't list them all. Um, so let me just sketch some of the underlying math and I'm only gonna describe a simplified version of stock flow diagrams in, in this, but we've implemented a more complex model, but I don't wanna confuse you with complexity here. So in this is a simplified kind of stock flow diagram. So it consists of a set of flows, a set of stocks. Each flow has an upstream stock and a downstream stock. So for example, S is a stock, I infected is a stock, little i here, the process of infection is a flow, and this has its s as its upstream 
and, and I is its downstream. And then we also have a set of links and links always point are these blue guys and they always point from stocks to flows. So we have here several links pointing to the flow uh, infection and that's indicating that both the number of susceptible people and the number of infected people will affect the rate at which people transition from the susceptible stock to the infected stock. This simplified model does not have the extra intermediate variables, which I showed you in the first uh, stock flow diagram. We only have stocks directly controlling flows in this simplified version. And we have to say what function is actually used to compute the flow as a function of the stocks that influence it. And so for each flow, little f, we need a function, phi sub f, which does that. Phi sub f is a function from r to the something to r, meaning uh, it takes a number of real variables and spits out one. And what are those real variables? There's one for each link whose target is f. So here, for example, we'd have a function from r squared to r, but the, the, the two numbers in the r squared would be the number of susceptible people and then the infected people, and then phi sub f would be some function you pick to describe the rate of infection as a function of those two variables. So there's a way to get a dynamical system from those. So def let's define a dynamical system on a finite set N to be a vector field on R to the N. So there are N variables, but a dynamical system is a vector. And the reason why we want a vector field is that it gives us a first order differential equation that describes how a point in Rn, which would be the stocks as a function of time, uh, evolves with time. So there's a systematic procedure, AKA a functor, that sends each stock flow diagram with set N of stocks to a dynamical system with set N of stocks. And so here's our uh, <clears throat> simple example here, and you can write down these differential equations from it. So the main point is that each flow contributes a negative term to its upstream stock, that is things are moving out of there and a positive term to its downstream stock, namely things are moving into there at the same rate. So using the theory of decorated coast bands, we can formalize all this. There's a category of open stock flow diagrams where the objects are finite sets and the morphisms are stock flow diagrams that are open, i.e. equipped with functions from those two finite sets into the finite set of stocks. Uh, and well, to be honest, I was lying. Uh, they're really isomorphism classes of stock flow diagrams are the morphisms in this category. As I mentioned in my previous talk, to, to be honest here and have the morphisms really be what I said at first, we need to use double categories. But this is a 20 minute talk, so I don't have time for double categories. It would take twice as long. So there's also a category of open dynamical systems where the objects are finite sets and the morphisms are open dynamical systems. So the apex here, the set N is equipped with a vector field on R to the N. And again, you should really work with double categories or else take isomorphism classes. And then there's a functor, again, constructed using the math technology uh, from open stock flow diagrams to open dynamical systems uh, that acts as the identity on the objects, the finite sets, but then it turns each open stock flow diagram into the corresponding open dynamical system using the recipe that I sketched out in an example. So then the key point is that by implementing these ideas in algebraic Julia, my co-authors who did all the hard work created a software package called Stockflow, which is now open source and available on GitHub that lets you do all the things that I've been alluding to. It lets you draw uh, or design, I should say, it lets you design open stock flow diagrams. The, the original stock flow doesn't let you design them by drawing them, but I'll get to that in a second. It lets you turn them systematically into open dynamical systems. That is, that's an automatic procedure. And then it lets you solve the differential equations given by those dynamical systems. And that's again, an automatic procedure. So it lets you compose not only decorated coast bands, but also multi coast bands. So here we have three different uh, 
stock flow diagrams, but they have, they, they're not just co-spans, they don't just have an input and output. This one here, for example, has three different finite sets mapping to it. So it's what we call a multi-co-span. Uh, so this multi-co-span, or we heard in the last talk, multi-span idea is connected to the fact that these um, decorated co-span categories are all hypergraph categories, or they give you algebras of an undirected wiring diagram upper ed. And so you can compose any multi-co-span to get a new stock flow diagram. So here we're just sticking together these three by identifying, for example, E in, in each place here and, and so on. Uh, so the really good news, which is something that's going on right as we speak, is that Osgood Lee and, and some other people on their team are building a graphical interface for stock flow that lets you actually uh, draw these or create these stock flow diagrams just by drawing them. This is a picture. It's not very thrilling yet because they've only been working on it for a few weeks, but it already actually works. Uh, and, and it will become more flashy with time, no doubt. And I hope to give some future talks where I could like actually build you a stock flow diagram in, in real time. I didn't dare attempt to do that today. And the key point is that it, because it's compositional, it allows teams to collaboratively build stock flow models. And it, it's based on a web browser. So different people in different cities can uh, build different stock flow diagrams and then people can stick them together. And as I said, any logic and other software is existing software is single user and it doesn't allow for composition. So this is really exciting to me. We're, we're actually getting category theory to do something. Uh, and indeed in all, August, coming up really soon, a whole bunch of my uh, collaborators and also James Fairbanks and others are gonna teach a week long course on the use of stock flow. It's being funded by the Canadian Network for Modeling Infectious Disease. Interestingly, uh, infectious disease modeling in Canada is largely done in math departments. So these people may not be scared to actually learn about category theory, but the software does not require that you know category theory. So this is a really practical tool, we hope, and will become more so with time. And by the way, even when COVID is over, if it ever is, there are other diseases. And so this is not just like a COVID project. Okay. Great, thanks, John. I have a question. Yes. Uh, actually, in two parts. First, uh, I'm familiar with something where at least I used to be familiar with a program called Stella. Uh, is that somehow uh, kind of a preview of what you are doing here? Uh, that's my first question. And my second question has to do with a community of theoretical biologists who I, I don't seem to believe in that the whole is equal to the sum of its parts which I think is what compositionality really means. So what do you think of those two questions? Um, so as my, my knowledge of Stella is fairly weak, unfortunately, but I believe that, so, so the stock flow diagrams go back to the work of James Forrester, who wrote a book uh, called something like Industrial Dynamics, where he was using these to describe models of the economy and businesses. And it's evolved over the years. And I believe at some point, uh, the Stella software was introduced to uh, work with uh, stock flow diagrams. And, it's, and I believe by now, the sort of most popular tool is this one I mentioned called AnyLogic. Uh, so all those are sort of in some way predecessors to what we're doing. And we want to get to the point where our software can do most of the useful things that those uh, do, but the compositionality is a brand new feature. So that's that's one of one of several brand new features we hope to have, but that's the first. As for your second, that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. The whole question of whether and to what extent that's true is like crucial to the whole issue of applied category theory and compositionality. So the whole uh, issue in a sense of all compositionality studies is to discover to what extent is the whole the sum of its parts and to what extent it's not. So for example, already in this simple case, 
we are able to compose the differential equations and get a, a bunch, get a new differential equation. So that is very compositional and that's very useful, but we can't take the solutions of the in differential equations being composed and in some simple minded manner, stick them together to get a solution of the overall differential equation. So these solutions, alas, are typically not compositional. Actually, Tim mentioned that like in rare cases, there, there might be. I mean, for linear differential equations, for example, there, there's a kind of compositionality pr principle for solutions. But, but for interesting differential equations, by which I rudely mean uh, nonlinear differential equations, we don't have compositionality in solutions. And that's a way in which the whole is definitely not the sum of its parts. In particular, feedback loops can, can form when you stick together small models that can lead to quite unexpected behavior when you, when you put those small models together. I do. Mm -hmm. Are there questions in the room? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, well, I feel uh, I know what you did, John. So I <laughs> started having a question myself. Uh, you talked about how there's like uh, an upgraded version, uh, but you didn't present that uh, today. What What are the features of the upgraded version of Stock Flow? Uh, and don't be honest, so focus on. Um. The, the it's it's continuously being upgraded. It's like one of these, what do they, they call it like a perpetual revolution or something like that. Uh, so so the, the very simple model that I mainly spent my time describing and which was first implemented uh, did not have these links to uh, variables which then can influence other variables which then ultimately influence the flows. Uh, so the, the, the full-fledged stock flow software has those. And there are other uh, features. For example, it turns out that there are lots of these variables here that are simply sums of a bunch of stocks. Those are like play a fundamental role in modeling. And so in a, we have a version with a more rich schema that has in the, gives you in the feet of your decorated coast band, not just stocks, but also some variables, that is variables that, that have this summation type behavior. And so then when you compose models together, those summation variables. So that's an interesting issue, right? Because uh, in general, when you, have, when you start getting lots of these variables that depend on other variables, it, it becomes more tricky to figure out how you're going to compose different models. But for summation, it's, it's very systematic and, and simple. So we have that and we have some extra features as well. So those were, uh, so there are a number of features that have already been influenced, uh, sorry, implemented in the Stockflow Julia software. And then uh, Nate and Xiaoyan are, are are systematically uh, moving those into their graphical interface one at a time. Uh, and there are probably lots of other things that Nate has in mind for what he wants to do. Some of which I know, like incorporating dimensional analysis, incorporating sort of a functorial approach to this uh, loop gain analysis I mentioned, which is like a way to uh, systematically detect uh, powerful feedback loops and other things like that, together with things that I pro he probably hasn't even told me about yet. So he, he really wants to make this into a practical thing. Okay. Toby, uh, Toby has a question. I have one question, thanks Bill. Um, do you have like stratified models? Do you have stratified models in the sense that certainly you were talking about earlier in the week? Like can you take pullbacks of models and things like that? Right. Um, so we haven't done stratified, we haven't like, played around with stratified models, but, but as you've uh, no doubt seen at some point, uh, the algebraic Julia gang has done stratif model stratification with algebraic, uh, in algebraic Petri with open Petri nets. And so the same math applies to stock flow diagrams. So one sh should be able to do 
stratify models using pullbacks there. One thing that excites me, my sort of a evil category theorist side of me, is that when you're doing those pullbacks, those are pullbacks uh, in the HOM categories of your, of your double category, so that you cannot do that stratification in the math. That's what I sketched out here, where you're taking your, your, uh, your double category and, and watering it down by taking isomorphism classes. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it sound, makes it sound very complicated, but it- John, uh, you're just saying you need the double category. You need the two cells. To... You need the two cells, yes. Yeah. But see, once you hook them into category theory, then they get like pulled into two category theory. And before you know it, well, I won't don't, tell don't you. Don't make me learn anything about three category uh, I'll get back to you in five years about that. <laughs> I like how, so we're all familiar with that XKCD, uh, like, you go to engineers and you say, have you tried <laughs> algorithms? So his question is, it comes out of five category theory and it says, have you tried taking slices? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that, that is a very interesting direction. Um, we have a question in the chat, which is um, uh, the causal relationships in, I think in your blue arrows, how do they relate to causality? I'm interested in that. We've seen a bunch of stuff about uh, Markov and base stats and Puzzle hmm. Is there any connection to I don't have anything super intelligent to say about that, except that yes, the blue arrows represent causal influences. And so if you know good stuff about causality and and the diagrammatic approaches to causality, you should try to apply that to this subject, I guess is what I'll say. Okay. Great. Thanks, John. Thanks. Congratulations on a great conference.